Right, hello everyone. Um, I'm Anthony Beaver, uh, and I've got the great pleasure today of uh, doing, doing this event uh, with Ian Morris. Um, anyway, and I'm delighted you're, you're all here. Um, of course, before I, uh, we begin, can I just ask you to make sure that uh, uh, your mobile telephones are switched off. Um, it has happened to me once before. It actually went off while I was speaking, um, and it is very embarrassing. And um, anyway, we're also uh, um, streaming today's events, or rather, the RSA is streaming today's events. Um, so obviously, welcome to all the web viewers. And a reminder that the hashtag is um, hash RSAW small ar. Uh, if you want to get involved in the discussion on Twitter. Um, so, housekeeping notices over. Um, it's a very great pleasure to introduce today's distinguished guest speaker. Um, Ian Morris is uh, Willard Professor of Classics, Professor of History, and a fellow of the Archaeological Center at Stanford University. Um, he's the best-selling author of Why the West Rules for Now, um, and has appeared on a number of uh, television networks, including History Network and PBS. Um, he's won countless grants and academic awards and is the author of 12 books and more than 80 articles on archaeology and history. So he joins us today for a small fraction of the insights in his uh, latest uh, work, um, published right now, uh, War, What Is It Good For? Um, and these issues are particularly uh, relevant, as you might imagine. We have always assumed that uh, war is bad for everything, and of course that is true with all of its horrors and, and so forth. Uh, but at the same time, there is the counter-argument, which I think, uh, well, we'll come to that in a moment, which really sort of started in the uh, 17th century, um, that in fact, without the formation of the state, uh, through war, um, things might be a lot worse. But anyway, Ian will be um, talking about that uh, particularly in a moment. But anyway, without um, further ado, um, let me um, ask uh, Ian to, um, to speak, and then afterwards uh, I'll, I'll ask him a few questions, and then we'll obviously open it up entirely for everybody else. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Um, can, can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. And, and uh, I'd like to thank the RSA for inviting me to um, come here today and all of you for taking your lunch times to come and hear me talking and, and pepper me with questions and tell me I'm wrong. And I'd like to thank Anthony for introducing me. And it's a, a great pleasure to meet him. I've been reading his books for many years. And it's a delight to be back uh, here speaking at the RSA again. Uh, the last time I was here was three years ago when I was talking about the book that Anthony mentioned, Why the West Rules for Now. And this new book, War, What Is It Good For?, very much grows out of the Why the West Rules book. Um, while I was writing that book, I, I did what I always do, which I, I write bits of the book and then I show them to various people and ask them what they think about them. And, and my, my long-suffering wife is one of the people who always reads uh, these things as I'm writing them. And so I, I showed her this big a big chapter out of Why the West Rules for Now, and asked her what she thought of it. And so she said, well, I liked it. And I could tell there was something else she wanted to say about this. And she said, I liked it. But then she said, well, but there was a lot of war. And I thought about this for a while, and it had seemed to me as I was writing it that I was actually keeping the war stories pretty much in the background. So this, this made me a bit nervous. So I was thinking, well, is there too much war in this? Am I, have I somehow misunderstood the story I was trying to tell in that book? Should I get rid of the war stuff. But the more I thought about it, the more it seemed to me that the reason I got a lot of war in that book was that um, violent, mass violence had been such an important mechanism in history through which really big changes have played out. Many, many, many of the most important things that have happened have been accompanied by massive amounts of violence. So, of course, I, I then get thinking about why is this and immediately decide, well, ah, obviously I need to write a book about war. That is a solution to my problem here. So I went off and did this. Uh, and, well, this year, you know, 2014, as you all know, uh, will have noticed, the centenary of the outbreak of World War I. And uh, it, coming over here from the United States, and one of the things that's really striking when you come here is 
just how much World War I stuff is going on in Britain. I gather the BBC has scheduled four full years of programming already, yeah, so you have all of that to look forward to. And it seems like you've been very much plunged into the minutiae of 1914 and the uh, lead up to World War I in, uh, in Britain over the last few months. But what I want to do today, what I do in this book, is really go in the opposite direction, toward the very big picture, and try to make sense of um, the history of warfare uh, across the very, very large scale. And basically, in a nutshell, what I suggest in this book is, you know, contrary to what the song says, you know, the song War, what is it good for? The answer in the song, as I'm sure you all know, is absolutely nothing. Well, contrary to that, the reason that there's been so much war in what historians write about, why war has played such a prominent part in the story, is in fact, it seems to me that when we look on the long-term history, war really has been good for something. Over the long run, I think war has made the world a safer and a richer place. Uh, war is hell, but the alternatives would be worse, as, as Anthony was just suggesting. Now, obviously, this is a paradoxical and very uncomfortable kind of argument to make. I mean, war is mass murder. What sort of a person goes around saying that mass murder can be a good thing? Well, I have the answer for you today. Uh, the kind of person who says that is the kind of person who's been very surprised by the results of his own research. This is certainly not what I thought I was going to end up writing a book about. <laughs> now, if this argument is true, it, you know, if when we look at the long term, war really has had major positive side effects for humanity, I think this has major implications for our thinking about war in the contemporary world. I mean, if we're interested in a safer and richer world in the 21st century, then surely understanding the functions of war in earlier human history has got to be important for trying to move us in that direction. So what I do in this book is really, I make four claims about the history of war, and I'm going to basically um, talk about these this morning. So, uh, this morning, it's not this morning anymore, is it? This afternoon, I talk about these. So the, the first of these claims um, is that by fighting wars, people have created bigger and more organized societies that have reduced the risk that their members will die violently. And this, I think, is the big claim. And this is something I think has been gradually becoming clear across the last 30 years or so. One of the things we now know is that if you, if you went back 10,000 years, back into the Stone Age, um, you would find societies very different from the ones we live in. Um, everybody in the world was a hunter-gatherer. Um, everybody in the world lived in tiny little groups, usually a dozen or so people, very unstructured groups, very few constraints on people. Um, because of this, you know, we've evolved as animals that are capable of using violence. There were relatively few constraints on people if they decided to use violence to settle their arguments. And um, the way it seems it worked was you get very few big battles in the Stone Age or anything like that, but you get this constant sort of background noise of low-level violence, homicides and raids and feuds. And a lot of anthropologists now think that Stone Age societies, your risk of dying violently if you've been born in the Stone Age was somewhere in the 10 to 20 percent region, which is a lot of people. It would mean like, I mean, in this room, we probably were talking like 15 to 30 of you would die violently. And that is a lot of people. If you fast forward to the 20th century, and you know, the time of two world wars, um, nuclear weapons get used, genocides are committed, in the 20th century, something between 100 and 200 million people died violently, probably. An astronomical, mind-boggling number. But 10 billion people lived in the world during the 20th century. Your risk of dying violently in the 20th century was 1 to 2 percent, an order of magnitude lower than it was in the Stone Age. Now that, obviously, that's a, a surprising, remarkable kind of statistic. But the explanation for it, I think, is more surprising still. This is really what my book is about, which is that starting about 10,000 years ago, in some parts of the world, a big change began where the winners of wars would often incorporate the losers into a single larger society. They would kind of swallow them up in, into their own society. Now, this had a series of consequences. As the societies get bigger, the governmental structures have to become more and more complex. The, the only way you can make these societies work is by doing this. And to stay in power, the guys who are running on these societies, they are forced to suppress violence within their society. 
Now, the reason they're doing this is not because they are angels. I mean, by definition, these are really violent people. These are the people who excel in violence, who rise to the top of prehistoric and ancient societies. But what they want in the world, they want all of you Stone Age guys to get up in the morning and go out to your Stone Age fields and work really hard and grow Stone Age crops and pay taxes to them so they can use them for all the things politicians use your money for, like refurbishing their second homes and things like that. That's what they want. What they don't want is you to go around hitting each other in the head and burning each other's farms down, because that, of course, will reduce their income. It'll weaken their state. They're more likely to be attacked and defeated by their neighbors. So there's a, like a selective pressure on the leaders of these societies to pacify their groups. Now, obviously, there are lots of exceptions. I'm talking about a 10,000-year trend over the whole world here. Lots of exceptions, easy to think of them. Um, in the book, I talk about this as the what about Hitler problem. I mean, this is not a very good description of Adolf Hitler. And in fact, you can you know, take your pick of mad dictators. I mean, Stalin, Mao, Idi Amin. There's almost no end of the genocidal, murderous dictators. But in spite of these extreme cases, the long-term trend is still very clear. Over 10,000 years, the unintended consequence of all the violence has been to drive the rate of violent death down. So as I say, very paradoxical. Rates of violent death have fallen by 90% over 10,000 years. War made the state and the state made peace seems to have been the big story. So that's my first claim that I make in the book. I try to demonstrate this in the book. The second thing I suggest is that war seems to me to be really the worst possible way we could go about making these bigger, safer societies. And yet it seems to be pretty much the only way that people have found. And in the song, War, what is, what is it good for? One of the lines in that is, Lord knows there's got to be a better way. But when you look at the historical record, apparently there isn't. Um, it's really hard to find examples of large groups of people agreeing to give up some of their freedom, including their freedom to kill each other and steal each other's stuff, agreeing to do that without either being forced to do so or out of fear that somebody's using force against them. And I've looked long and hard for counterexamples, and I haven't found any that I, I found convincing, at least. And this, I mean, this is very much the argument um, that Thomas Hobbes came up with in his book Leviathan back in the 1650s. This is why Anthony said, you know, it's an argument that goes back to the 17th century. But Hobbes got to this conclusion by speculation and sort of analytical reasoning. I think we're now in a position that we have evidence to demonstrate the truth of this idea. So that's the second claim. The third claim is that you know, war, war has been good for something, but we can actually go further than just saying war has made the world a safer place. War has also indirectly made the world a richer place, that these larger, safer societies created the preconditions for more sophisticated divisions of labor, more elaborate um, trading mechanisms. And over the centuries, the, the wars themselves, terrible destructive processes, but their side effect has been a richer place. We see this over and over again, destructive conquest of one group by another. But you come back and look again a couple of hundred years later, and everybody, the conquerors and the conquered alike, are better off than they were before. Extraordinarily surprising um, discovery. Okay, the final, the fourth of the points is that if these three claims are true, it seems to me that only one conclusion is really possible. That war has been good for something. It's indirectly made the world a safer and a richer place. But I would also suggest that war has actually been so good for these things that it's now putting itself out of business. Um, that we've got weapons so destructive and organizations so effective that a, a real all-out war in the 21st century potentially could destroy humanity altogether. War is putting itself out of business. So, okay, those are the claims I make in the book. And basically, the, the, most of what I do in the book is telling the story of warfare from prehistoric times through to the 21st century, tracing the changes in the rate of violent death, uh, and lot, lots of stories, lots of details about things. And um, we don't have time for me to stand here and read the book to you. You'll be relieved to know. But I just want to sort of skip, skip over the details, basically, to what I think is the obvious question to ask. You know, if you were to read my book and decide, my God, he's right about everything. What a fantastic book. Obvious question, I think, would be, well, why? You know, why has this really bizarre thing happened across the last 10,000 years? And I think to explain why this has happened, you've got to go beyond the long-term history itself. You're not just looking at 10,000 years of humanity, but look at what biologists have been doing on the evolution of violence. Because our understanding of this has changed dramatically in the last 50 years. I mean, 50 years ago, we knew 
almost nothing about um, the use of violence in other species. And it's an amazing thing, but up till 1960, no biologist had ever studied our nearest genetic neighbors, the, the other great apes. No one had ever studied them in their natural settings. And in 1960, Jane Goodall sets up her Gombe research station in Tanzania. So our, our knowledge has been transformed in the last 50 years. And one of the things that's now very, very clear is that violence is an evolved adaptation. And what I mean by that is that uh, pretty much every species of animals uses violence in some way. They've all evolved, almost all evolved to use violence. But each species has its own way of using violence, its own amount of violence. And each has evolved a kind of equilibrium point in the use of violence. And each species is different. You know, obviously lions and, um, I don't know, lions and lambs use violence in, in very, very different ways. Actually, I'm not sure the lambs use it at all. I don't know. Maybe they do. But lions and lambs use violence in very different ways. Um, and what happens is within each species, if you are too violent, if you're a lot more violent than the, the equilibrium point, you will tend to drop out, or your, your genes will drop out of the pool. Because um, you, uh, if you fight constantly, you, you're going to get injured or killed fairly quickly. You're less likely to pass your genes on to the next generation. If you're not violent enough by the standards of your species, also, um, you're going to be disadvantaged in passing your genes on to the next generation. You're going to lose out in the race for food or mates or whatever it might be. So each species evolves toward an average amount of violence that it uses, an average form of using violence. And we, are, we, we humans, we are animals too. Exactly the same thing is true of us. We evolved toward uh, an equilibrium point, which was this 10 to 20% rate of violent death we see in the Stone Age societies. So we're just the same as all the other animals, except that we are completely different from all the other animals. Um, our biological evolution produced the miracle of nature that each of you is carrying around at the top of your body as, as we sit in here. There's nothing in nature quite like the human brain. I mean, for all we know, this is the most complex evolved um, object in the entire universe, for all we know. The human brain basically changed everything. It was like other species of animals, they change the amount of violence they use by evolving biologically as their environment changes. We do that too, but we also evolve culturally. As our environment changes, we can change our institutions and cultures and change the way we behave in response to that, which other animals, pretty much speaking, can't change their behavior in response to the payoffs in this sort of way. And that's why the rate of violent death among humans has fallen by 90% in the last 10,000 years. Even though we are basically the same animals we were 10,000 years ago, our behavior has changed dramatically. As I say, no other animals do that. And it's changed, I suggest, in the book, because these larger societies that we started creating produced these stronger governments that changed the payoffs from violence. Like now, I mean, if you ask me a question I don't like, and I decide the obvious solution here is to get up and run into the audience and beat you senseless, that's a really bad idea because the payoffs from that form of violence are strongly negative for me. We've learned you don't do this kind of stuff anymore. You pay a penalty for it. We respond to the changing environment. And I had felt that one of the things I learned writing the book is that we can't wish war away the way the song suggests that we can, just by saying it's good for absolutely nothing. But on the other hand, we are very good at responding as our environment changes around us. And I think the big lesson that comes out of the history is that what has changed our rates of violent death has been the creation of these bigger and stronger governments, the Leviathans that Thomas Hobbes talked about. They scare us straight, basically. Okay, to conclude, to, to, to wrap this thing up. Now, if that's right, I mean, if I'm right in understanding the, the larger shape of history in that way, um, can we learn anything from this for how to conduct ourselves in the 21st century to continue making the world a safer and richer place? And I think we can. And I think we can learn particularly by looking back what, uh, on my terms, is a very short period of time. Just looking back to the 19th century, practically yesterday. Uh, by the 19th century, um, we've had thousands of years of the evolution of these bigger societies, the stronger governments, lower rates of violent death, and so on. By the 19th century, we've reached the point that one society, um, Great Britain, is pretty much running a worldwide system at this point. I mean, Britain doesn't rule the world after 1815, but it coordinates what 
what's going on around the world in a way that no society has ever done before. Britain is the only industrialized nation in the world. It has the industrial, financial, and to, to some extent military muscle to raise the costs for other states of using violence in ways that disrupt the British system. And this is what the British do. And uh, this explains a large part of why from 1815 to 1914 there are so few great wars. And the, the British, though, found themselves in a slightly weird situation. That Britain's wealth depended on selling goods and services overseas. Um, to make that possible, to generate the profits, Britain then policed international open markets, enforcing the British version of the rule of law and uh, free trade, kept the sea lanes open. Britain also encouraged other countries to industrialize and become wealthy. Because Britain can't go on becoming more wealthy unless foreigners can afford to buy British goods and services. So Britain pays a, plays a great role in the industrialization of other countries in the 19th century. And it's very successful at this. So successful, in fact, that by the 1870s, some other countries, particularly the USA and Germany, are getting to the point that they are beginning to be serious rivals to Britain. So there's this great paradox in the way the British world system worked in the 19th century, that the more successful Britain is in its role as a kind of globocop, the harder it becomes for Britain to continue as a globocop because it's creating the rivals that can potentially challenge it. Uh, now, when this paradox begins to become clear in the 1870s, nobody is going to challenge Britain. It's a sort of you know, intellectually, people observe this, but nobody worries about it too much. Forty years on, though, in the 1910s, things have got to the point that no one is entirely sure anymore that Britain is capable of raising the costs of using violence so high that it's always a bad idea. And some countries, particularly Germany, start to feel that their strategic problems are so bad and the situation is so unclear now that maybe